Hi everyone, um, it's really a, a pleasure to see you all here. Thank you for joining us in such a cold evening. I'm Eugenio Rafini from the Department of Italian Studies. Welcome to this event. Uh, welcome to the Casa Italiana. Uh, thank you to uh, Stefano Albertini for hosting us for this event, which is really, um, I would say, a special one for various reasons, um, both at a scholarly level and uh, at a very personal level, in the sense that we are presenting a book um, by Elina Bolzoni, her latest book, um, Una meravigliosa solitudine, l'arte di leggere nell'Europa moderna. Um, Professor Bolzoni has um, strong ties with the department here, with the Casa Italiana. Um, she has been teaching um, at NYU on several occasions um, and uh, um, as a global professor she is part of uh, the faculty um, and um, it's really um, a tremendous pleasure to have her um, here um, and also we are joined by um, another uh, esteemed colleague and a very good friend uh, Alessandro Jamey who's joining us tonight from Bremer College um, and uh, the idea is really to uh, take this opportunity to talk through the book, um, which is an amazing one, and uh, uh, also to share thoughts about what kind of scholarly stimuli come from this book. Um, and um, we will try to keep it as informal um, as possible. We will have two short, shortish presentations um, um, from um, Alessandro and uh, then I will also um, say something. We will then of course leave um, room for uh, Professor Bolzoni to respond and then we will really um, try to have a conversation about the book and the various implications that um, this book suggests. Um, Professor Bolzoni doesn't really need much introduction here in the sense that she's very well known, um, a leading scholar of the Italian Renaissance, uh, she has been teaching at the Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa uh, for many years and uh, she is the author of several monographs um, focusing on a variety of topics, um, Renaissance poetic, rhetoric, um, the tradition of patriarchism, uh, uh, the tradition of uh, portraits in words and images, and these are just some of the uh, many topics she has been working uh, on. Certainly a pioneer in the study of um, the ways in which words and images relate, um, and uh, many of her contributions have really paved the way for a new season in this kind of um, scholarship, um, reaching out to art historians, um, historians of um, um, intellectual history, of course, uh, scholars in literature, so on and so forth. Um, so without further ado, I would like to um, introduce Alessandro Jamey, um, who's, as I said, coming from Brynmore College, um, who will um, begin our um, discussion of uh, Lina Bolzoni's book, Una Meravigliosa Solitudine. Like Professor Ruffini, as a graduate student, I had the good fortune of studying literature with Lina Bolzoni. Anyone who had the chance to do the same, and I believe there's a little, uh, at least a couple other people that did in this room tonight, knows that studying literature with Lina Bolzoni, like any authentic training in the magical art of being a curious human being, can be a disorienting experience. Especially for those who think that reading literature doesn't have much to do with looking at images, with the virtual realities built by our memory, with our own creative power as time travelers, and ultimately with sorcery, conjuring, possession, and even exorcism. I had the impression that my whole training with Lena was basically a long course on how to be a reader. 
I had to learn that, yes, as a reader, I alter and mold what I read, that I have agency over my readings, like theorists of reception and philosophers of history taught us in the 60s and the 70s. But also that, more importantly, what I read has power over me, that I am what I have read, that the most credible and realistic portrait of my mind and soul and abilities is my library. In this sense, I feel like I learned to read again as an adult, this time for real and for good, just as one learns again how to speak when one realizes that one has an accent. The book that we are presenting tonight is, of course, a study of great European authors as readers and a history of the theme of reading from the birth of humanism to late modernity, but it can also be read, I believe, as a manual and a spell book, as a guide to reading for those who already love to do it. It gives us the rare pleasure of being, in fact, Tarzan. Now, I am projecting the Tarzan clip tonight because a couple of years ago, I received it as an attachment to a text from England. The text said, and I quote, La tua relatrice è impazzita. <laughs> it was sent to me by a friend who was studying at Oxford and who went to a plenary session of an important conference and found Lina, the famous Renaissance scholar, talking about Tarzan and Jane with this image on the screen. My friend couldn't believe that Renaissance studies could have anything to do with Tarzan and Jane. But then again, he did not study literature with Lina Bolzoni. <laughs> Like her teaching, Lina's research has the prodigious ability to cut right to the most important questions and to reveal the urgency of very old forgotten problems. Through her plain, captivating scholarly voice, Virgil becomes a virus able to turn our mind into a hacked computer. Valchiusa becomes a haunted house. Federico di Montefeltro Studiolo is reassembled like in an exercise of augmented reality, and zombie girls rise on the Via Appia while humanists summon the mummies of grammarians. Lina's journeys through time invariably reveal that the past is, in some ways, or better in some people, which is to say in some books, actually quite ahead of us that an erudite close reading of ancient texts, images, and places can be as foretelling and as fascinating as science fiction. A crucial thing that I learned by reading Una Meravigliosa Solitudine is that, to paraphrase Machiavelli and maybe Walter Benjamin, when we venture into the jungle to meet Petrarch, Montaigne, or Proust, we are Tarzan and they are Jane and not the other way around. This book shows how books for a long time worked like telephones. At the dawn of what we call modernity, in a less dystopic and more joyful way, they were the equivalent of what David Foster Wallace imagined as videophony, a way to be with each other without being in the same place. In fact, they were better than phones because they connected people who were not even from the same time. I have read Una Meravigliosa Solitudine in Oregon, of all places, last summer on the screen of my iPhone. Scrolling with my finger instead of turning pages, I felt a bit guilty, as if I was betraying the very rituals that I was reading about. Almost immediately, in the pages of the introduction, I found Bronzino's portrait of Laura Battiferri. And I remember that when I, was visiting, when, when I was a visiting student here at NYU, in the graduate lounge on the first floor of Casa Italiana, there was a version of this portrait in which Laura's fingers caress the touchscreen of an iPad. I tried to find the same Im image on Google, but I could only find a tweet by Professor Anna Wainwright, a brilliant scholar of Renaissance studies that I had met 
in the same graduate lounge. She's an alumna of Casa Italiana of NYU. And Lina is, of course, featured in that tweet. But unlike my friend from England, Anna evidently did not think that la mia relatrice è impazzita. After all, she did study literature with Lina Bolzoni. I think that Apple, Google, Facebook, and all the companies that every day try to guess who we are and what we want by monitoring the strings of text that we read and write on the screens of our phones and tablets should really read Una Meravigliosa Solitudine. It is not a case that Amazon started its immense empire by making books more available and tracking who got which book. However, paradoxically, it is the very exponential growth of availability that diluted the meaning of our virtual and physical libraries. Algorithms would understand us much more deeply if we had to choose, if our space was more limited, if obtaining and keeping a book was still the complex problem that it once was, when one would literally dress up before starting a conference call with the favorite authors. I remember that when I was a, an undergraduate student in Rome, I went to protests with my peers, holding covers of books by our favorite authors as shields. I don't think we invented this practice, but we definitely understood that combining ourselves into a library, into a community of remote and solitary strangers from different times and places, clarified immediately who we were and what we wanted. Now that in Rome people are burning books and bookshops, I understand more clearly that we were right. But the violence of fascists and the delusion of hypertextuality are not the only threats that modern reading is facing in this endlessly postmodern age. In a way, by reminding us about the risks that modern readers undertake when they immerse themselves too much in the reading, and by connecting the pleasure of reading with selection, architectural arrangement, and cure, this book invites us to think of an ecology of reading. Many signs, like the catastrophic flood in Venice right now, show that we might uh, very well be close to the moment in which we will be forced to choose what to save and what to preserve in the immense archive of readable information that Europe has amassed for centuries and keeps on amassing. Some digital humanists are already advocating for a complete switch to the virtual version of manuscripts and editions because the maintenance of ancient books is not sustainable. In any event, as far as I'm concerned, after reading it in Oregon on my iPhone, I actually ordered a physical copy of this book from Italy. And now I keep it in my office at Bryn Mawr. I cannot imagine my students not to see it during my office hours among the other relatively few books that I was able to bring with me from Italy, because moving books is hard. It would be like missing a button on my shirt or something like that. I would feel naked like Tarzan. Thanks. <laughs> Right. So this is Alessandro's copy of the book. Grazie. And uh, my copy of the book. So, um, as usual, uh, it would be uh, good to have at least half an hour to process all the things that, all the stimuli which come always from um, Alessandro's um, talks. And uh, uh, thank you so much for opening up uh, to some of the issues which I will also try to tackle, though, from maybe a slightly different perspective. I would like to start from um, a spoiler. Uh, Lina, Lina's book, Una Meravigliosa Solitudine, um, Marvelous Solitude, uh, published by Enaudi earlier this year, is indeed a marvelous book. Um, and I hope that Lina won't mind if I say that this is really Lina Bolzoni at her best. 
Um, as someone who has read most of her scholarly work and certainly all her monographs, you know, she's my former advisor after all, so I had in a way to go through her um, works, um, it has been an enormous pleasure to find in this book many of the threads that through her original and provocative scholarship she has been interweaving over the years. Um, the rhetoric of image making, the spatial and epistemological continuum within which images and words talk to each other, the working of memory and the techniques by means of which memory makes for a tool crucial to literary invention. These are just some of the clusters that have been at the core of um, Lina's research. Uh, they all, in a way, come together in this book, which focuses not simply, I would say, on reading practices in modern Europe, as the subtitle suggests, but first and foremost, on reading as a space for cultural encounters, on reading as a space for interaction, where not only do readers meet with the authors of the texts that they are reading, but also find themselves. Um, a dynamic which is emblematically visualized by the cover image of this book, Pietro Antonio Rotari's Ritratto di Giovane con Libro, which is now in St. Petersburg. Uh, and this is the only image uh, from the book, which is very rich in images, uh, that I will show, because the other images which I'm going to show really um, come from other things. My idea was really to avoid to sort of bring up the same images which uh, Lina discusses in the book, trying to respond to those images with other images. Um, of course, in their heterogeneous nature, these images are, you know, just a free choice, and I guess that uh, any reader of this book could come up with uh, many other things to respond to the many stimuli which come from um, the book. So let's go back to the young lady with a book, um, an 18th century portrait where the book functions as a mask as a screen that protects the reader from the world out there, but also as something literally in between the reader and the world, something that makes the reader's gaze reach out to us, the observers. We readers of the painting, readers to core, I shall say. The book isolates the reader, separates the reader from us, but it is this very idea of solitude, the marvelous solitude of the title, which in fact entails dialogue, conversation, and interaction. The tension between reading as a form of experience primarily concerned with the self and reading as a form of negotiation with the other runs across the chapters of Lina's book starting with the quotation from the Arab philosopher Abu Ayyan al-Jaiz, which opens the introduction. And I quote, The book is like a garden which can be brought around in a sleeve. The book is like a being that speaks in lieu of the dead and functions as an interpreter among the living, like a friend who goes to sleep only after we do fall asleep. End of quote. So the text and the book, be it a manuscript or a print, become mirrors, at times reliable, but often, as Lina indicates in her discussion of Erasmus, deceiving. The text and the book are treated and conceptualized by the authors studied here as bodies made of flesh, bones, and blood. Bodily metaphors about owning the books, touching, absorbing, even eating the books, populate the imagination of the literary discourses that Lina Bolzoni explores. Libris satiari nequeo, says Petrarch to Giovanni dell'Incisa around 1346. I cannot satiate my appetite for books, says Petrarch. A veritable struggle that informs the life and the intellectual biography of the poet whose books are indeed bodies that accompany his life, faithful friends able to talk to Petrarch, voices from the past that let him travel in time, voices whose ephemeral existence is entrusted to signs on the page, the words on the page, relics that need to be brought back to life in order to let 
the life of the present escape the threat of death. And this is a theme which, of course, runs across all of, um, thank you, Alessandro, sure, all of Petrarch's um, works. Indeed, the magic space of Petrarch's library, that is at the center of the first chapter, functions as a time machine. And to the eyes of someone like me who's very interested in ideas of reception, particularly reception of antiquity, this time machine offers invaluable opportunities to think through the non-linear dynamics of reception. In that respect, Petrarch is in very good company. The library as a time machine is a lab where fellow humanists aim to bring the fragmented bodies of their predecessors back to life. A project that is not devoid of some danger. A project that speaks to the anxieties that inform modern culture. Lina Bolzoni's discussion of the text as body metaphor produces uncanny resonances, or at least this is what happened to me while reading the book. I thought, for instance, about Victor Frankenstein's lab. If the humanists treat the ancient texts as dismembered bodies that need to be reassembled, bodies which they desire, bodies which they love, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein takes the metaphor at face value. Why not to treat the body as a text? If philology can be successful at reconstructing the text, why shouldn't be science and technology able to reconstruct a human body? Now, these questions might sound paradoxical. The reason why I am sharing them is because they reveal, I believe, one of the most productive features of this book, something that I know is also very important to the way in which Lina Bolzoni reads the texts, namely the possibility to think about metaphors in the text as more than mere figures of speech. As she posits, for instance, in chapters three and four, focused on the portrait of the author and the text as a mirror, metaphors are certainly part of given literary traditions. Yet, if we readers make the effort to give them some credit, they can let us into the folds of the text. They can give the text the breath of life which Victor Frankenstein wanted to give his creature. For sure, this is risky business. Frankenstein's creature gets out of hand, to say the least, and becomes the monster. Likewise, books, as Lina recalls, can make people insane. Think of Don Quixote and even Torquato Tasso. But books can also bring people to death. And this is the case of Etienne Dolé, the heretic publisher of Rabelais Gargantua, whom also Lina mentions in the book. If we buy the fascinating idea of books as living bodies, then the impact they have on human life can be truly significant. Lina's journey through reading practices in modern Europe offers compelling proofs of that. Her innovating reading of Niccolò Machiavelli's famous letter to Francesco Vettori of December 10th, 1513, situates Machiavelli's dialogue with the ancients within Machiavelli's ongoing epistolary conversation with Francesco Vettori. There, the idea of transferring oneself into the interlocutor, tutto mi trasferisco in loro, as Lina shows, is much more than a metaphor. A veritable translatio, this has to do with navigating both space and time in terms that, even during the exile, are powerfully political or can be powerfully political. Books are thus not only repositories of texts, but they also mark our presence in the world. Not only do they participate in the anxiety of influence, but they also feed what I like to call the anxiety of presence. Once again, this can lead to extreme outcomes. Lina's reading of Machiavelli's statement, tutto mi trasferisco in loro, made me think of a letter by another author who is dear to Lina, Giovan Battista della Porta, whose main preoccupation towards the end of his life was to secure the survival of his books as a way to live beyond them and beyond death. Io vorrei trasformarmi in libri. I would like to transform into books, he writes to Cardinal Federico Borromeo in 1612, when he offers his beloved books to be stored 
in the newly created Bibliotheca Ambrosiana. So in this case, the man becomes his books, read, written, and owned. Dialogo, lettera, and lettura, one notion comes to include the other. Within the forms of interaction that these terms entail, the individual is never really alone. And this is where, in my opinion, the politics of reading comes to full fruition. This is the space where reading the novella of Manon Lescaut, Marguerite Gauthier reads, in fact, about herself. This is the space where we readers look at ourselves in the books. So the books which we read become actually just a way to look at ourselves. But this is also the problematic space in which the equation between books and bodies can lead to violence and oppression, where the victims are both the books and the bodies, as we are constantly reminded even by very recent events. Yet it is in the constant tension between the dream of a silent solitude and the dialogue with the other that, as Lina's book suggests, lie the powerful possibilities fostered by reading. On the one hand, the claustrophobic isolation of the compulsive reader, Peter Keane, in Elias Canetti, Out of the Fe. On the other hand, reading as a constructive practice based on the idea of sharing as in Azar Nafizi's reading Lolita in Tehran, both books are among the earliest recommendations I received as a student from Lina. Uh, I do remember that these books were really part of uh, my uh, initial reading list um, as someone working you know, on the Renaissance, right? So to go back to the idea of something which is not just a historical period, but something which is much more than that. So one image that captures the dynamics explored in Lina's book, as well as, I believe, um, her take on his topic, is that of Prospero, the magician. But not the one who drowns the books at the end of Shakespeare's The Tempest, but the one who opens the books to the other in a productive gesture. Similarly, as Lina's final chapter suggests, the tower where Michel de Montaigne speaks to the authors and writes the essays is not just a secluded space. Rather, the tower does function, or I should say can function, as an open book. And much could be said here about the architecture of libraries as political statements. But I will just conclude by saying that this idea of the text as a window functions, in a way, as the book held by the young woman in Rotari's portrait, a book that, at the very same time, shields us from the tempest and makes us engage with it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, to Stefano for uh, uh, giving the possibility to have this wonderful presentation. And uh, thank you very much uh, to uh, my good friends <laughs> and uh, former students uh, who gave uh, a so rich idea. I was wondering, but uh, what? <laughs> it's, it's about my book? <laughs> Because. <laughs> They really, uh, I mean, uh, they, they gave a, a, a proof of how an intelligent uh, reading of a, of a book can be creative, can be uh, suggest a new dimension. So I am very proud of you. <laughs> And uh, I, am, uh, I am very happy that uh, uh, you read uh, the book that uh, I have written, but also Uh, you, you create a new, a new ideas with uh, your imagination, or with uh, your culture, so it's uh, really moving for me, and it's really moving for me to be back here at NYU, that is so important for my life, uh, and uh, for colleagues, for friends, for students, and also for uh, uh, the new ideas, the, the new uh, method of research that uh, it was possible for me to find uh, here. 
And uh, uh, I am very happy that uh, this book uh, is discussed with many different, in, in many different perspectives. Because uh, uh, the idea was exactly uh, to think of uh, these uh, very rich myths that uh, the humanism, the Renaissance created around the book. And uh, uh, you mentioned the main important metaphors that uh, are part of this myth. And uh, uh, my idea was exactly to think of this myth today when uh, um, there are many people who say that, okay, uh, the culture of book is finished, uh, uh, the culture of reading, of, uh, this kind of reading, very personal, in solitude, uh, with uh, a kind of uh, uh, slow time and so on. The idea is that, okay, everything is in danger today, everything maybe is finished. I don't think so. I, I think that uh, uh, also the new technologies can create new conditions, but maybe uh, some components of, of this myth that you have uh, mentioned in a very rich way can, can continue. And uh, the idea is exactly uh, that uh, the culture, the, also when we read the ancient text, uh, it's not a kind of academic attitude, not, uh, uh, but, but it's a vital experience, can be really be part of uh, our life and uh, can help us uh, to recognize ourselves and also to find, uh, as Proust says, uh, our rhythm, uh, rhythm secret, our secret rhythm. Um, so uh, I am very, <laughs> very grateful for this presentation. And uh, I hope that uh, someone of our public in uh, this uh, call today <laughs> uh, maybe are interested in uh, questions or comments. Thank you so much. I volunteer to bring the mic to anyone who wants to speak. Thank you, Lena. Thanks for writing the book. Thanks for coming back uh, to NYU. Um, so I uh, got your book, and I took it to um, Binghamton, where I had to give a Bernardo lecture, and it was about Francesca. And so I had the book very much on my mind. And I was particularly intrigued by your um, your last chapter, which is sort of like an epilogue about Ruskin and Proust, is so interesting because you make this kind of leap out of the Renaissance into the modern and um, um, what we call the modern, <clears throat> and um, and uh, that that Proust, who loved Ruskin so much, was so critical of him about this this sort of idealistic, like, it's not really a conversation, it's all about being alone. So you imagine Proust with his cork room, right? I mean, hating people and everything and scribbling away. But, um, and so then I was thinking about Francesca and Paolo and them, soli eravamo, e senza alcun sospetto. And I began to think, you know, what is it about reading? I mean, is it, it, it part of the problem is that they're alone, right? I mean, that's part of the problem. So that, so that you know, should we read alone or should we, should we read together? And anyway, I just wanted to share that. When I was up there, I also, they just acquired two new books of hours. So I was going through these books of hours, which of course also makes us think about reading practices among pretty fairly regular people. I mean, wealthy, but nonetheless not clerical people. And, um, and the, the books are all damaged by kisses and uh, caresses and, and things like that, that you had been talking about too, about the kind of wanting to consume physically a book as if it were another human being. So um, so anyway, if you wanted to comment about the Ruskin and the Proust portion, I guess that would be my question. So thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, my, my first idea uh, was to finish the book uh, with Tasso. And uh, um, I, uh, my, my first idea was that I could uh, write something about Proust uh, because uh, I was thinking of how Proust is, again, the idea of Saint-Beuve, that it's important to know the biography of an author. And, uh, uh, okay, so I, I was thinking, okay, I can uh, 
uh, write uh, very briefly about uh, this idea that uh, the tradition uh, that uh, I, um, I, I study in this book is very different from many modern ideas, structuralism, uh, psychoanalysis, because it's a tradition in which through the text you can really know the soul of the author. This uh, kind of a myth of transparency, a fascinating myth, of course. We, we know that it's not exactly like this, but something true is into this myth. So my first uh, interest for uh, Proust uh, was linked uh, exactly uh, of uh, how is against uh, the uh, saint uh, ideas. But uh, at a certain moment, I was really fascinated by uh, the discussion that uh, Proust has uh, with Raskin. And it's a very complex situation because Proust uh, likes, uh, loves really uh, Raskin. He translated uh, Raskin uh, also uh, with, uh, uh, I mean, the Proust mother helped him to trust. So it was a very intimate <laughs> relationship with uh, Raskin text. So I, I found much more than <laughs> I, I was thinking to, to find. That's why I decided to, to put uh, the, this appendice, a kind of last chapter, and uh, I see that uh, it functions. I mean, I had many reactions, many positive uh, reactions, because the uh, position of Proust is very complex. It's against this idea of dialogue, of friendship, because I think uh, he has a very social idea, uh, maybe a snobistic idea of friendship. Uh, so it's against the idea of intimacy, of uh, uh, profound dialogue, but in a, in a certain sense, he, uh, he comes back to the, uh, to the idea of dialogue. But it's a very uh, personal dialogue. It's an interior dialogue. And also the title of the book comes from uh, Proust, because it was not easy to find a title for this book. I asked many friends <laughs> in order to find a good title. At the end, uh, with uh, Ernesto Franco, who is the director of Einaudi, we were discussing and he says, OK, it's Proust. Meraviglioso solitudine. This idea that uh, when you read, you are alone, but your solitude is populated by the voices of the, of the people, is the voices of the authors. And in the same time, it's populated by your interior voice that you can find exactly in this kind of dialogue with the authors, with the text that uh, you read. Tal, thank you so much for being here. Um, this is actually the first time that I hear about your book. Uh, nonetheless, I'm really excited to, to read it afterwards. Um, uh, kind of going uh, um, off with that same theme of um, reading or literature as a social act, um, what what is your your vision for uh, the future in literature um, in terms of activism and the way that we can use um, this medium to um, to integrate others that are uh, different from us? I'm thinking of um, the current uh, migration crisis in Italy, for example, or uh, different other social political currents that um, might uh, benefit from um, thinking about reading as a social act? Oh, thank you very much. This is a very important question, very difficult, but absolutely essential question. And uh, uh, I think that if you think, uh, uh, okay, I, I can think of uh, uh, the tradition uh, of uh, uh, the reading as a dialogue. And uh, I think that is very important because uh, uh, dialogue is uh, a kind uh, uh, of friendship, it's a kind of hospitality, because uh, you open yourself and you give hospitality to the other. So I think that is very important. It's a kind of ethical uh, suggestion that comes from uh, this uh, tradition. And uh, the other um, component also for the future, 
I think that, okay, the, the reading is a, a solitary experience, but we know that um, the reading can be also uh, the creation of a community. And uh, for example, I think uh, of the experience of the uh, women groups of uh, reading. And also, um, there are in, uh, in the books by Alberto Mangel, many important experiences also in, in the historical uh, perspective. Um, so I think that uh, exactly because uh, um, also, I think, with the, the new technologies, uh, you, you can create communication, you can open your mind, uh, you can create a dialogue with other authors, but also, I think that in this way, you can be ready to create dialogue also with the other person. I don't know if, if it's an Ethiopian idea, but I think so. So I think that uh, um, this is the great uh, uh, power of reading. That's why sometimes uh, the books uh, are destroyed and so on. Can I ask you a question that I thought about when you were responding on the Proust question? Like, as soon as I came to America, and people started asking me, so what's your theoretical frame? Who's your favorite theorist? What is your movement? I'm like, I studied with, with Lina Bolzoni. I don't know, because when I read your um, La Rete delle Immagini, when I read your introductory essay to the edition of um, um, Giulio Camillo, no? my impression was like, oh, amazing. So we didn't need post-structuralism to understand that, you know, to understand certain things. We didn't need that. It was already there. Like when Eugenio was talking before about Renaissance studies, not as just you know, studying a specific time, but as adopting a certain, a certain perspective on reality, on our mind, on what humanity is. Um, Basically, what I always think when I read your stuff, and especially this, not be because this is a book that if one looks at the cover and the back cover, one thinks, ah, interesting, reception studies. And then, no, there's no reception study. There's no, there's, no, um, there's no need for theory. Everything comes from the object that you analyze. It's almost as if you're demonstrating. We already knew. A lot of the things that we tend to be excited about today, we already knew them, and we should get back, not because the past is better, but because a serious reading of the important things, a serious reading of very famous things, like the letter to, to Vettori, you know, things that have been read a million times, it's worth reading them again, because if we take them seriously, if you look at the metaphors, if you look at the images and try to make sense of them, we get to the same conclusions that computers give us, that digital humanities do, that even quantum mechanics does. So my question is, how do you put, like, what's your secret, how can, like, how does one do that? Like, have you ever, th uh, how do you feel about theory? This is a theory. This is something that I've always wanted to ask you as a student. Uh, okay, uh, of course, uh, I, I am not young, so I, I've been living the, the hero of theory, <laughs> the different theories. Yeah. And each time uh, I found some of my colleagues who uh, were absolutely sure that finally we have uh, the true, <laughs> the real <laughs> way of, uh, uh, of, yeah, of theory. Of, uh, now really we understand uh, what literature is. I am a little skeptical. <laughs> I mean, I think that uh, the different theories uh, have been important. I, I try to, uh, to understand what kind of new perspective the different theories can give uh, to me. So I am, I am for freedom. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, uh, the, what is uh, wonderful in our uh, uh, work it's exactly that each time you, you f really, you meet another person when you read a text. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you read the ancient text, uh, it's really a kind of science fiction. You are right. I like science fiction. 
because uh, you find another world. So what I like is exactly to be fascinated also by this other world. So I am for the dialogue. <laughs> and uh, OK, if uh, uh, I know that this tradition is against uh, the formalism, is against the structuralism, of course, I, uh, I read uh, Shlovsky, I read a very important text. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that uh, they are being very useful for me. But in the same time, I think that they cannot be something uh, that uh, oblige me uh, to, um, in a, to a certain perspective. Maybe uh, the, what fascinates me in the literature is exactly the richness of the text and uh, the possibility to find different elements each time. If you read uh, a classic uh, in a certain moment of your life, and uh, you read the same text uh, many years uh, later, the, the reading is different. But exactly because you create a dialogue between you and the text. That's why uh, Steiner says that uh, we, uh, we need uh, the books, but also the books need us because it's our act of reading uh, that gives a new life to the, uh, to the books, to the text. That's why I like my work, <laughs> because, because it's so rich. It's not, I mean, it's not linked uh, to a theory. I am interested in theory, in different theories, but it depends on what uh, I, I study. I mean, I, I was uh, very glad to give the voice the different voices, the different authors that uh, I, I read. Thank you. It is so weird to speak with you in English. I think this is the first time in my life. <laughs> okay. um, can I ask a question? Um, <laughs> I'm sorry to have missed, Lena, most of your remarks, um, but I have read your book, and, and, and if this question has already been answered, um, I, I apologize in advance, but um, what I, I love many things about your new book, and one of the things that I find most fascinating is this idea of giving a, a body to the author, either through a kind of portrait or through, um, as you say, this wonderful metaphor of thinking about putting together Quintilian's manuscript, you know, putting all the limbs together and creating a whole body. And one thing I'm wondering as you move from Petrarca through Tasso and Montaigne at the end of the Cinquecento, are there changes that you see in this process of giving a body to the author so that you can have this dialogue as we move from manuscripts into print? I know many of your illustrations, the gorgeous uh, author portraits that you provided, many of them were from manuscripts, I think a few were from printed texts. I'm just wondering, does, that, does the status of the medium as we move into the printing press years change that relationship, or, or does that stay re relatively stable? I don't know. <laughs> I have to think about, because for example, I was thinking of uh, an author that uh, I, uh, has been very important for me, this is Giulio Camillo. He has this idea of a kind of anatomy of the text. But uh, this is not necessarily linked uh, to the printing press, because Camillo is between uh, the manuscript and uh, the printing press. So I really don't know. This is a very important question I have to think about. What's your idea? You know, I spent all semester in the, uh, up at the Beinecke every week where they're looking at various Renaissance texts, and, and my students have you know, they, they don't have the tools at this point to really engage in a very deep manner with these, with these texts, whether they're in manuscript or they're in print. But I think, you know, maybe nostalgically, because we're now in the virtual age, and I know since you've done so much work with digital editions, I'm, I'm also curious about your <laughs> thoughts about that. Um, but I, I think there's a kind of nostalgia, at least among these younger students, for, you know, where the real hand actually wrote a real word, whether it was the scribe or the author him or herself, and so I think they feel that the, the, the body of the author, as it were, is, is more evident in these manuscript texts, and yet, again, I, I don't know. And, and again, I, I asked it partly because you've been so involved in, um, in thinking and working digitally for the digital humanities, and so I'm just curious as we move into the third medium, as it were, what, what happens to the idea of the, of the, of the corpus of the author and, uh, and of the text. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
<clears throat> can I add something? Um, first of all, thanks again for these. I think it's such a provocative conversation which we are having. And uh, uh, so I have one question which really comes from the title in a way because of course you know we have been talking about this proustian memory the meravigliosa solitudine which really comes from that kind of word and you know while reading through the book and then of course proust comes up at the very end i you know i kept thinking that this is such a paradoxical thing and in a way with proust this paradox gets to, to some sort of Paracism, because Proust is the same person who, you know, is, tries to be surrounded by silence while writing, but then is the most social writer ever, right? I mean, he forces us to go through volumes of this magnificent uh, book, which is all about interaction and, and dialogue and conversation. Um, and yet, the idea of reading for him uh, is something which has to do with, with solitude. Um, but then, the subtitle of the book is not simply the practice of reading, but it's the arte di leggere. And of course, you know, for someone like you, who's a super familiar with the uh, uh, Renaissance lexicon, which of course comes out of the classical tradition, arte is ars. And so there's something which also ties with the idea of theory, right? To go back to Alessandro's point. So uh, there's something there which has to do with building skills through the practice. So we don't really get to a set of um, skills and a set of um, recommendations or instructions on how to read a text um, once and for all, uh, but there's this constant approximation to uh, some sort of ideal conjunction with, with the text and with yeah. his, its author, uh, which seems to be always sort of the um, the goal, um, but then always um, out of reach, and, and and there's an element of dissatisfaction with with this process, which of course has also to do with curiosity yeah. and this idea of a of a constant um, discourse, which is produced by the very act of reading. So within the life of a person, you have a book read maybe at you know when one is young, and then going back to the same book a few years later, things change. But then we have also the same text read by different generations yeah. of readers. Yeah. Um, and so the situation becomes even, even more, more complicated. So I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering whether this idea of ours, in a way, yeah. is beyond the choice, behind the choice of uh, the subtitle. Yeah, because uh, uh, for many of these authors, uh, the problem of reading is linked uh, with the idea of beauty. Because uh, many of them think that uh, Virgil, Cicero, and so on um, are uh, the, beauty, the most beautiful authors. It's a, it's a very strong canon, classical canon. So, uh, Eugenio, you are right. You art di leggere means that each time you, you try to, to find uh, which is the secret of this beauty. And this beauty is with you because you are reading the text, but at the same time, it's in another world. <laughs> uh, you, you cannot uh, get uh, this, uh, this beauty. So it's true that uh, there, is, uh, um, there is this uh, very complicated situation. And uh, also, uh, another important element is that uh, reading is linked to the construction of your memory. And uh, uh, the way of reading, the arte di leggere, is very important because uh, it's important in order to create the conditions for your new text, for the invention of uh, the new text. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, a very, it's a really an arte. It's really something that uh, you, can, uh, you cannot find uh, in a final moment. I mean, uh, you have to, to buy this... Uh, each, each time uh, this uh, dialogue uh, and uh, and also the problem is also the memory because uh, um, there is a very difficult um, relationship between uh, the new and the, the old uh, I, I mean the new of your writing and uh, uh, the old text that you have in your memory and Petrarch and Montaigne say okay I 
uh, I was convinced to, uh, uh, to have written something new, but <laughs> Virgil, <laughs> Plutarch, <laughs> uh, I, I didn't remember, but they were in my memory. So it's a very complicated situation. <laughs> In fact, if I may add something very quickly, I really can't wait for the book to be translated into English because I'm teaching a freshman seminar and I have, I'm supposed, among other things, to teach these students how to write a good academic paper. And the problem is always the problem of Petrarch, the problem of Tasso. It's like, I tell them, okay, you cannot plagiarize your sources. Now, plagiarism is this big thing that you learn in America, no? So, uh, in, in Italy, it's like, Sort of, and uh, and they, and they're like very worried about plagiarize, and they say, "Oh, I don't want to plagiarize," but but they're like, "But how can I remember what I learned where? When did I read things? I don't know why I know things." And I want to tell them, "Like it's Patrick. Like you know, it's the same problem we've having. We've been having this problem throughout modernity. Don't worry." And I want to give them. It was like this is the art. Sorry, ask another question. So since you brought it up, um, the canon. So, um, you know, there you all are, the normalisti, and it seems normal to you that uh, you would read certain books and that everybody's read these books, and it's great because when you read it, then you're reading other people who've read the book. You know, you're all part of this happy community and everything, and uh, it's a community that I was happy to join coming from I don't know, from the beach in California where I grew up and suddenly I was happy to join your party. But what, what do you say? I think this is an important statement that we're constantly being asked to defend and justify. Why read certain books? Why read those books? And what is your answer to why is there a canon and how it happened and so forth? Um, maybe you don't get those questions in Italy, but we sure get them here. So. I can, I can tell you about my personal experience. <laughs> I grew up uh, in a very little village, uh, village uh, close to Cremona and uh, to Avosa. <laughs> and uh, I, in, my, in my family, we had no books. And for me, it was a really a moment of freedom when I could uh, go to the library, I could read the books. So, okay, I know that this is a very personal experience. But I think that in any case, um, the possibility to, to read books is a really a possibility to open yourself to the other worlds. I mean, to open your mind, to become more free. So I, I, I think that is really essential. I don't know if it's possible uh, to communicate this experience, but maybe <laughs> we can try. I mean, uh, it's a possible the possibility, the possibility of reading is something that uh, uh, make, uh, make you rich, make you uh, different. So uh, I think that is basically true also today. It's a question of the canon, I remember, Stalina. Should there be a canon of books that we should all read, or is it something that we should... Uh, uh, this, is very, this is a very difficult question. I mean that it's important to read, <laughs> and uh, uh, you can begin also with uh, many different uh, authors. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, okay, we can think of different canons. Of course, we know that uh, uh, the different cultures have different canons. But in the same time, I think that uh, the school, the university have um, to give uh, uh, the possibility uh, to understand uh, the difference of quality. I mean, I don't, I don't believe in one kind of quality, but I believe that it's important to recognize the different qualities of, uh, of a text. Uh, and I understand that the idea of quality can be different in the different canons, in the different cultures. But I think that uh, this idea of, uh, uh, of choosing, of, uh, um, yeah, of uh, like the capacity of understand the different quality of the text is important. So I'm not against the canon. <laughs> of course, I am against the idea uh, to, um, 
too strong, uh, too limited of the canon. But uh, uh, not, I am not against the, the idea of the different qualities that you have to understand. And the pleasure of reading, of course. The pleasure of reading is absolutely essential. And I think that it's possible uh, to appreciate the beauty of one text. And uh, uh, this is important for the pleasure of reading this text. But it's a very, very difficult question, of course. Um, continuing this conversation, do you think we are uh, in modernity, we're losing the um, art and the idea of the pleasure of reading? Because, um, you know, not so long ago I was um, still a student and uh, I remember having just so many readings from different subjects, right? And oftentimes you just have to run through them in order to catch up. But now I wish, you know, I, I could go back and spend more time with, you know, each piece to really um, get everything uh, I can from, from each author and take my time with it. But as we move towards uh, even more globalized world, there's, there, we're just bombarded with so many options. Um, how, how do you envision this balance between um, keeping the, the pleasure and the quality of reading and also trying to keep up with everything that the world has to offer? Uh, there are two different experiences. I mean, because uh, uh, you can read uh, what you like and uh, today is possible uh, because uh, also through Google Books uh, we can have a kind of universal library. <laughs> this is really a unique possibility. Uh, so I think that there are two different experiences. I mean, the pleasure of reading because uh, you, uh, you need uh, uh, to enjoy your time, you are free, you, you read the novels and so on. Uh, but uh, there, there is an also a pleasure of reading more linked to the quality. So I think that the, the function of the school, the function of the university, has to be exactly to, to give you the possibility to have both of, both of the, these uh, pleasures, I mean. And uh, uh, the, um, the relationship between uh, these two kinds of reading is very personal. It's very linked to, to your experience. But uh, these questions are really difficult. <laughs> I mean, I, I speak when I'm thinking. <laughs> Ma noi ti, ti sfruttiamo anche così, ti spremiamo. A question regarding the idea of literature to be read or to be listened to. And as we know in the origins, especially of Italian literature, but not only, it was a communal experience and someone would read out loud, be in a monastery or in a court, and the other people would listen. And Petrarch starts, voi che ascoltate, it doesn't say voi che leggete. Um, and I was thinking that Come, going forward, uh, more and more people, uh, especially in this country, appreciate literature by listening to it. Yeah. It's not a phenomenon that has reached Italy in a considerable way yet, but in this country, audiobooks are a huge phenomenon. The only difference is that the listening to literature of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance was a communal experience, and now it's a very individual experience. Um, but I, I'm very interested in, in that How is it different the way in which we enjoy a, a literary piece by reading it and by listening to it? Uh, I think that uh, also in Italy now, there are many people interested in, in audio libri. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> in one of the discussions that we had uh, uh, about my book, uh, one of the public um, Ask exactly your question. And uh, uh, I don't know exactly which is the difference uh, when you read personally a book and uh, when you, you listen to it. But for example, uh, if you, uh, 
if you listen to the poetry, it's really beautiful because uh, uh, there is uh, the music, of course, there is the rhythm, and maybe uh, when, uh, uh, when you listen to someone uh, reading the, uh, the poetry, or you, you read uh, no, uh, the poetry, this can help to, to understand, to, uh, yeah, to, to understand the, the pleasure, the, the quality of, of the text. And uh, uh, so I, and also, uh, coming back to a question of the community, it's true that listen someone who reads the text can really create a community. And uh, uh, the, uh, the idea that, uh, yeah, is, is the idea that uh, the, the book can speak, no? can speak. And uh, it's an idea that this tradition, uh, I mean, explain literally. You, you, can, uh, you can have a dialogue with the book because of the, the, there is the voice of the book. The voice of the book is the voice of the, the author. Uh, I think that, but it's only uh, an hypothesis. If you if you listen to to a text, um, okay, uh, it's uh, one level of understanding of love in this text. But uh, uh, in a more, uh, if if you personally read the text, maybe you can analyze the text better. But it's a different way. It's a, it's more linked to our work. But this is a very important question. And also there is uh, uh, the old problem that uh, uh, the written text cannot speak, no? It's Plato, Phaedrus, and so on. And uh, this idea of dialogue is exactly uh, um, uh, an attempt to, uh, to answer this question, no? because the text can speak. And I think that when, uh, when you listen to the text, uh, there is a kind uh, of uh, theatrical representation of this capacity of the book to, to speak, no? to, to, uh, to create a dialogue with you. Can I ask a question, if, uh, even if I didn't read the book? It's fine, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Eugenius uh, bringing up uh, um, Frankenstein got me thinking, also in relationship to uh, Jane's question about whether the, material, the changing materiality of the book might tell us something about uh, a changing uh, relationship with it in a, in a more bodily sense. Because in, uh, in Frankenstein, uh, the relationship text and, and, and body of the, of the monster is obvious at yeah. many, but also the datation that is being inserted corresponds also to the personal life of uh, the author, etc. And then we have, however, this incredible reverse where the, in Scotland the female monster is being made and then the result is immediately displeasing and it's been like torn, like pages of a book apart, right? So also after making the monster there are bouts of uh, mal melancholia, the monster is conceived at a candlelight, so there are several uh, several uh, obvious relationships, however, most of them are negative. Even by putting together well-proportioned parts, the result is monstrous. So there is an obvious ambivalent uh, uh, relationship with, uh, with a text that can be now even be torn apart, tossed away, and make you feel ill. Uh, so, you know, that's the age of cheap prints and all sorts of stuff, so the book becomes less valuable, etc. So I was wondering if, Lina, maybe you came across a similar type of more antagonistic relationship, more dramatic, more unpleasant relationship with the text, like the Frank, what Frankenstein suggests, but a little bit m earlier in, in the time. If there is any type of, uh, if there is any example we have from the Renaissance where the, the relationship with reading is, or, and with tradition is, is predominantly conflictual, negative, etc. So not, not such a nice company, but just bad company. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or or uh, an encumbrant one, or, you know. Uh, okay. Uh, Patriarch says that uh, the, the books can make you fool, <laughs> but maybe Eugenio can answer the question. <laughs> uh, 
Well, I mean, I think I, it, it, it's a great question. And uh, actually, I, I think I thought about similar clusters of ideas while reading, especially the first part of the book, because of course, you know, you get to the end of the book and most of the sources discussed here are, I would say, describe reading in a positive light, right? Um, and there's this idea of a constructive dialogue with the books and the idea of opening your ears to the voice of the book, which is also opening your ears to the voice of the authors of the past. Um, but then the question is, you know, what happens when books create some sort of different um, uh, uh, response on the part of the on the part of the audience, and uh, you know there are uh, books which are deemed dangerous because of their content, right? Um, and of course, um, this kind of approach to assessing the danger of the book is also extremely problematic. Uh, I mean, there is all the tradition of, um, uh, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert of um, uh, natural magic, but, you know, working a bit on De La Porta, for instance, I remember, uh, you know, finding all these interesting sources about the fact that books which give you access to what we call black magic are dangerous themselves, right? There's something dangerous in the object and and in the text, but then most of those kind of things are only dangerous when you bring them aloud in terms of uh, pronouncing them and bringing, and bringing them to some sort of uh, acoustic presence. So that's one of the possible dangers of, uh, of reading. Um, and then of course there are all the political uses, if you will, of, of reading. I mean, not all books, unfortunately, are a source of pleasure or even a source of constructive um, social bonding, right? I mean, we could mention examples of books which uh, go in totally different directions. So it's not the object per se or, you know, the idea of writing uh, per se which gives value to, to the book, but also, I mean, we could say what's in there. Um, and to go back to the previous point, I think that the idea of finding a quality in the text, even if this is a slippery field, um, and it's very subjective as an experience, it's certainly worth trying. And uh, one of the ways to assess the quality of a text is certainly to think about it as um, something which can produce acoustic pleasure. So not only poetry, yeah. but you know, also prose. Um, and uh, it's true that you know, novels are meant to be read primarily on our own in a silent reading, but then Again, and I'm risking to jump back onto the canon sort of thing, the masterworks are also those kind of books which produce pleasure when you listen to them. You know, if you listen to uh, someone reading um, I Promessi Sposi, there's something in the prose of Manzoni which uh, makes it for a pleasant experience. Mm -hmm. uh, if you listen to someone reading Flaubert, there's something there in the quality of the text which is almost mesmerizing, even beyond the content. And then I think it's fairly objective to say that there's quite a big amount of texts, books, which are intriguing because of the subject matter, because of the content, um, but maybe they don't really produce the same kind of um, acoustic pleasure, right? So all these layers, I think, come up when we assess the quality of uh, uh, of the book through the act of, of, of reading. And the art of reading is also, is also about assessing uh, 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 these voices from, from the past, I think. And I know that sort of I brought the discussion to a different uh, uh, point, and, and I think Nicola's question remains um, a very uh, important one, but also difficult to assess. Well, one thing that I thought when you were asking the question was the two most whiny authors of, of, of the book, which are Petrick and Tasso, of course not. And Petrick, not the way in which Petrick is so guilty about writing the songbook. Oh no, I'm writing the songbook, that's terrible. And uh, the representation of the songbook as a book in the 16th and 17th century, no? in, in illuminated manuscripts and English, 
when it becomes a book, it's a dangerous book, it's a bad book, because it's a book that is sinful, and it knows that it is. It's a book that will deviate you from, say, from, being, from being good, from being a good, uh, a good Christian, a good man, et cetera, et cetera. And, so, and of course, there is this pleasure of the fact that I am in the bad company of, of Petrick. Then, in a way, Machiavelli, when Machiavelli you know, talks about his day in, uh, in, in the letter to, uh, there is this, this like, they're good, like I dress up well when I meet with Cicero, like when I meet with the real canon classics. But before that, I go to the streams and I go around and I read these books that are not really a serious comp, it's more of a like, nice thing that I do, like my friends. And then at night I go, I go to the serious people and tutto mi trasferisco in loro. And Tasso as well, not like the, 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 the painting um, the uh, I can't French, uh, De La Croix that uh, that uh, Tasso Eugenio projected, not Tasso and Santana. What happens there? No, Tasso is 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 forced to write for these people that mock him. No, there is this bed that connects the outside of the of the cell and Tasso, and there is this piece of paper that like the literal book torn. No, that he's writing. And the, the, like, the people are reaching out to touch it. So there is this also like, it's a very bad kind of company. Like you are working for the very people that are making you mad. Like as a writer, you're, so, you're almost exploited. No, you are the monster. You are the Frankenstein monster. You're creating, uh, there is this sort of like almost proto-anti-capitalist proto like reading of like the author as this like proto-romantic, of course, not the albatross, all this stuff. I was implicitly suggesting that uh, uh, to taking the metaphor to literality, that precisely we start being able to talk in this more conflictual manner about past uh, authors, it's easier when books become cheaper. Mm -hmm. That's that, that was yeah. a possibility. But also like very expensive books in Valcusa, like very difficult to find books in Valcusa can do things like they fall on your foot. Right. Now, Petrak talks about like this, like, I'm more interested than in the monster part, in the ghost, like this, the, but also pixie, like, you know. do we have other comments or thoughts or questions um, I would certainly recommend to read, to read the, the book, book. <laughs> I, I would like just to say one final thing that today I mean to sort of um, um, respond to Alina's first comment um, when so Alessandra and I have been you know in touch over the past few weeks and trying to coordinate about the presentation and we haven't had time to do that so you know we said let's talk over this past weekend to you know avoid that you know we sort of end up saying the same things and of course we weren't able to do it and then today we met up in my office upstairs and uh, I think I told him well you know I think I'm not really going to speak about the book <laughs> and he said oh well that's the same for me uh, so you know uh, we thought about you know sort of gathering ideas around it and that's how it, how it happened and in a certain individual's way even if we even if we hadn't coordinated we ended up doing the sort of same same thing and I think this was all because of you know the suggestions which really come from, from the book. So, from the right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.